Hello again. Welcome to another episode of Leading from Alignment with our good friend, John Opaluski. And John has a guest to introduce us today. Yeah, Jim, it's good to be with you on the podcast today. We do have a special guest with us today. His name is Carl Vaders. Uh, Carl is uh, a pastor. He is an author. And uh, he's written three books, I believe, and uh, one is called Small Church Ascent. Oh, four books. Okay. Well, the three that I'm aware of are Small Church Essentials, uh, The Grasshopper Myth, and 100 Days to a Healthier Church. Carl, what's the, what's the one that we're missing? Uh, just a little over a year ago, I wrote The Church Recovery Guide about coming out of a time of crisis. can't remember what inspired that. <laughs> Something in church history, I'm sure. Something, yeah, yeah, way long ago. So Carl's, yeah, Carl's heart is to uh, help pastors of small churches, and you know the, the 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 vast majority of churches in the United States are are would be considered small. And uh, he his role is to resource them to lead well, to capitalize on some of the advantages really of pastoring a small church. And um, he, he believes this, and I, I appreciate this so much about him, that big and small churches can and should work together. And I mean, that, that reflects the heart of what we do at Converge Coaching and, and through this podcast. And so, Carl, uh, w- welcome to the podcast. We're so glad that you carved time out to be with us. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Yeah. So, Carl, to, to help us to kind of get to know you a little bit better, tell us a little bit about your story, where you're from, how you came to Christ, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm, I'm actually a third generation pastor. Uh, my grandfather was a pastor. My father was, and my father's still alive and kicking today, but has retired for a few years. Um, I'm born and raised in Canada. And um, when I was uh, 16, we moved to California, and I've lived here ever since felt a call to go into ministry, fought against it for a little bit because I, I, I didn't want to be going into it because it was the family business. That's not a good, <laughs> you know, there, there are other things you can go in as a family business. Pastoring, you really got to have your own call. And so it took a little while to kind of sort that out. But then when I did, um, so I've been now in pastoral ministry for about 40 years. Uh, the last 29 years I've been here in uh, Southern California, Orange County, just eight miles south of Disneyland. And uh, the church we came to had been through five pastors in the previous 10 years. Wow. And uh, we had come out of a church that was uh, just a toxic environment, and I I was almost ready to leave ministry. So a wounded pastor and family came to a very wounded church. Um, They had a dozen people on a typical Sunday, 30 on a really big Sunday. A very small building, but on a big major street. In fact, on one of the streets that actually borders Disneyland eight miles to the north. So tens of thousands of people pass by the door every day. So I thought, well, we'll get this thing big in no time. And then, you know, onward and upward. And it didn't quite work out that way. Um, (laughs) It did get healthy. It did get somewhat larger, uh, but it never got big. And it didn't keep, you know, relentlessly growing like the church growth books told me should happen. So I kept looking around going, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? We, it's, the church seems healthy, but it must not be healthy because the numbers aren't multiplying like they're supposed to if the church is healthy. And through that almost left ministry just in, in discouragement and frustration, thinking I must be messing this up. And um, I actually spent some time with a Christian counselor who asked me at one point, if, if it wasn't for the numbers, would you call your church a healthy church? And he barely had the question out of his mouth and i my in my answer was so automatically yes it's amazing he like he almost sat back in his chair and went okay this is not like a, a maybe this is healthy this is like so the why are you worried i said well because it, 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 i must be missing something the church cannot be as healthy as i perceive it to be if the numbers aren't matching it because everything i'm reading says healthy things grow and if i'm not getting bigger then i must be missing a point of health somewhere yeah but, Everything I can see looks like it. And then he said a phrase that changed my life. He said, you have to figure out how to redefine success in ministry. You have to define success in ministry without numbers attached to it Mm. because it's killing you and it's killing your church. Yeah. And I said, I don't don't even know what that means. He says, yeah, I don't either, but we have to figure (laughs) that out together. (laughs) You know, that that started me on on a journey to where I am today to figure that out. You know, uh, uh, Jim uses this uh, terminology quite a bit that, that, uh, when we get to heaven and uh, we're going to hear, hopefully hear a well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, Jim, would you speak to that just a little bit? Because I think that really kind of maps to what Carl is saying here. 
Yeah, well, I just had a friend that pastored in, in Flint, Michigan, one of the most dangerous towns in, in the United mm-hmm. States, top three miserable places to, to live for, you know, in the last 10 years. And um, after 14 years of great fidelity, uh, he was done, felt a release and came back to 20 miles south to Fenton. <laughs> and and just 20 miles difference, he came back really dejected, had failed. It never grew. It, did, it never succeeded. And so I, I just let him through the exercise to some degree that your counselor did. Just that, you know, if you went to China and you'd led 100 people to Jesus over the course of 14 years and discipled them and never had more than 20 people in your group, but you you rescued people from perishing, you know, would you would be welcome back as a hero because you went to China. Yeah. And, I, and I promise you, going to Flint, Michigan has some... Some large challenges, uh, maybe some that are larger than going to China, and uh, you know, you're you, you're you're defining your success poorly. Like, so he's going to ask you, did you do the best you could do, and did you do it faithfully? Well, then, well done, good and faithful. You know, quality and fidelity is measured in a way that numbers are just not. Yeah. Well, speaking of fence in Michigan, we may know the same person. Is it Chris Vidarelli? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know Chris. Chris Chris does a great conference. He's been doing it almost every year for the last several years for small church pastors in Fenton, Michigan. Yeah. Really? He's never told me that. That's so funny. I Now yeah. I got a beef with Chris. You never invite me to your conference. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it's great. They've done a beautiful job with their building there. It's one of those old, kind of older, classic kind of buildings. And when you walk in, it just feels so new and fresh and inviting. They've done a great yeah. job there. On South Holly Road. I know it well. Yeah, yep, I do, too. So, Carl, how did you make the uh, in your mind, you know, as you as you process this with your counselor and now you're helping churches that are small, uh, smaller, let me put it that way. Um, how did your heart for helping other churches with this develop? I'm interested in that part of your yeah. journey. Could you share that with us? Yeah. Yeah. Well, shortly after that time with the counselor, I, I, I started looking around and trying to discover i looked for a book basically and you know tell me what a healthy small church looks like and couldn't find one so i just started putting bits and pieces together and teaching it to our staff and kept griping to my wife that nobody's written this book uh nobody's written a book about this until finally she just kept telling me you got to write the book and i finally just in exasperation looked at her and says i'm not writing a book nobody knows who i am nobody's going to buy a book by me and she looked at me and she said okay you want a book about small church pastoring. Who's going to write that other than a small church pastor? And how many famous ones do you know? <laughs> oh, so if, if you want, if, if quit complaining and write the book. So that's where it came from. I just, I wrote it out of my own frustration and not being able to find it. I actually wrote it. So my first book is a grasshopper myth. I wrote it. And then just after I was written, I felt like, oh, I've done that. I, and I let it go. I just sat, let it sit on my computer. I didn't think about it. And then six, six months later or whatever, you know, she's asking, you know, where's that book? I said, oh, I wrote it. It's just on my, you know, it felt like a journal. I just got rid of it kind of. And so she said, well, you know, take a look at it. So I'm sitting there and I'm reading it. And after the third time of me going, oh, that's good. She, she pauses and she goes, you realize you're reading your own words, right? I said, yeah, but it's been six months. It feels like somebody else's stuff. And if it's ministering to me after just six months, then maybe it will help others. So I refined it and put it together and self-published it. And to my absolute shock and amazement, it started selling like crazy. And then I started the blog and it started getting traction like crazy. And it turns out I'm just, I'm speaking into um, this, this huge uh, under appreciated and under resourced segment of the church, which is half of the Christians in the world who go to a small church and 90% of lead pastors who lead a small congregation and, and, and yet 90% of the information out there comes from and or for a large church. Yeah, and right. very, very as little, little is written from or to a small church perspective. Yeah. I, I recognize that same thing. John, I've taught on this in the seminars is that we define success as numbers. So yeah. we want successful people to teach us how to be successful. And if bigger is better, then, then everybody that writes the book, speaks at the conferences, does the blogs, is a, is a, has a large base, a large social media following, a lot of, you know, we call success versus obedience. I, you know, a, a church of, of 2,500 or 25,000 has certain characteristics. They function under certain principles. Tell, tell us about your, your insights. Uh, what are the principles? Uh, if I'm pastoring a church that has 100 people in it, 200 people in it, 50 people in it, uh, as many as 250 people are down. What are the principles that you would look at? Um, you know, if you're talking to me, like, I don't know how to pastor a church of, of 100 people. 
Carl, help me. How do I pastor? What am I looking for? What are what are the gauges I should pay attention to on my dashboard? How should I lead? What are the, what are your insights in that area for our listeners? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. My, my my biggest takeaway over the last you know forty plus years of ministry, but especially over the last uh, ten years or so, speaking to other small church pastors, is um, a, a couple of things. One. Uh, our churches are way overcomplicated, and small churches are mm. I- extremely overcomplicated. Yeah. We have way too much stuff going on, <clears throat> so we have to simplify. Uh, the smaller the church is, the fewer things you need to be doing, uh, and then do them really, really well. Uh, yeah. As an example, there's a small church in southern Indiana. <clears throat> a few years ago, they discovered <clears throat> they were trying to figure out what they could do well, and they're in a little region, our agricultural region, with almost nobody around, <clears throat> so they don't have a population to draw on. And I was talking to the pastor one day, and long story short, they, he, he was watching the, the congregation die, and he was sitting in a, uh, in a funeral, another funeral reception, thinking, this is the only thing we do well is funeral receptions. And then he, it hit him, we actually do this well. So he went to the funeral director, and he offered, anytime anybody in this area dies, let us know, tell them that we will s- serve and feed their family on the day of their funeral, and we will give that grieving family one less thing to worry about, because we do funeral receptions well. And he says, since then, they've touched every single family in that region, and the church is growing. They have a nursery going now that they never had before. It's not much bigger than it was, but it's active, it's vibrant, it's touching their community. And they literally found it out of this thing. And so this is kind of their 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 thing is funeral reception. I mean, church growth through funeral reception should be the title of my next book, right? Yeah. It's so, it's so but it, they found a thing. And sometimes the thing that you think is your biggest weakness, I mean, the little people are literally dying in our church. That's about as weak, big, a big a weakness as it gets. And he figured yeah. out a way to see a strength in that. So simplification is one thing. Another one is discipleship. Um, in small churches, we tend to chaplain more than we tend to pastor. Okay. Now, chaplaincy is great, vibrant, important ministry. So people who are called to chaplaincy, we need more chaplains, not fewer. Military chaplains, hospital chaplains, police chaplains, you name it, we need chaplains. But chaplaincy, I'm going to way oversimplify this. So if you're a chaplain, I am about to way oversimplify the wonderful work you do. But chaplains tend to do ministry for people. They bring ministry to people. They go into a prison and bring the ministry to people. They go into the the military and they bring ministry to the soldiers. Very important ministry. We tend to chaplain our churches, and the smaller it is, the more we tend to lean on the chaplain model. We do ministry for these people. That is not the calling of the pastor. The calling of the pastor in the only place where the word pastor is mentioned in the entire New Testament, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, says that pastors, along with the four other main leadership gifts mentioned there, have one job, and that is to equip God's people to do works of ministry. Our job isn't to do it for them. That's chaplaincy, and again, that's oversimplifying what they do. But it is pastoring, which is not to do it for them. If you do all the ministry for your church, they'll let you. Yeah, right. (laughs) But neither they nor you will grow spiritually or emotionally in that. You will stunt them and you will overwhelm yourself. We have to be equipping them. So in a smaller congregation, you get to do the equipping more one-on-one. So if you've got a if, you, if you've got more of a one-on-one, I want to be there for the people when they're sick. I want to dedicate the babies. That's that's part of your calling. You're probably going to lead a smaller congregation, but that does not let you off the hook of discipleship being your primary purpose. Okay. In a bigger church, you're going to disciple through proxies, mm-hmm. but discipleship still has to happen. Big or small, discipleship is the main thing. The smaller it is, the simpler you need, need to do, the smaller it is, the more likely the pastor is going to do more hands-on discipling, but discipling has to be front and center of everything we do as a pastor. Mm-hmm. Can, I, can I interject a question here real quick, Carl? I, you talked about simplifying, and I, and I think with, you know, the three of us talking here, we now had to say, yeah, simplifying. But I think we also realize that simplifying means the Sunday school class, that that's that one person's ministry they've been doing for 25 years. But we, we only we only have so many teachers, we only have so many rooms, we have so many chairs. And so we can't do it well. In other words, making it simple means we're actually going to do a lot of the things that have been done and people kind of might take some identity or ownership of that. We're going to get rid of some of that. What do you, what do, you do when it's time to... You know, birthday parties are fun. Funerals are sad. What do you do when it's time to say goodbye to a boys and girls program or a, a, a quilting program or any any sort of program yeah. that needs to go away now? It, one of it is one of the hardest things to do as a small church pastor. I've had to do it multiple times, and every time you do it, it's very very difficult. Yeah. The good news is, the more regularly you do it, the easier it gets. 
Mm. Um, but but the first few times that you have to go into an older, no longer effective, but still loved by a few ministry, that is very very hard to do. Um, uh, so there are a couple a couple principles behind that. First of all. You have to be mission focused. If you are constantly mission focused with the people, what are we here to do and what fits that mission? Then right. you can fold it into mission and you can go this particular method used to fit the mission of the church back when our culture acted in this particular way. Our culture no longer acts that way. This no longer fulfills the mission in the way it used to do. So you've got to tie it to mission. Right. Secondly, um, you need to have a process by which you make these decisions. For instance, in our church, our process is we are always uh, fixing our least effective ministry, and we are always fixing the least effective part of our building. That's our process. Everybody who comes through the doors and goes through the membership hears that and understands there is always a ministry under construction. There is always a part of the building under construction because we live in a society that changes that quickly. So we look at the list of things and we go, okay, right now, Let's say seniors is our least effective ministry. It's not a bad ministry. It's not wrong. We still want to minister to seniors, but of all the ministries you're doing, that's the one that's least effective right now. So how do we make it more effective? And then as you make it more effective, then people understand the reason for it. And then something else is the least effective and you fix that. When people know the process, then they're not surprised by all of a sudden we're changing this. Why are we changing that? I don't know why, because... The pastor went to some conference and said, this is the cool new way to do that. No, right. this is our process. <laughs> so people need a, a, a place of comfort. And for most people, mm. the program itself is the place of comfort. We need to replace it so that the process becomes their place of comfort. Oh, that's good. They can rely on the process. Then they're okay with the changes. People, churches, we, we think the churches don't like change. I, I, what I've discovered is churches have a harder time with surprise than they have with change. No, that's good. If they can understand the why, they'll go with your father. Right. And that is so good. You know, I, I, my mind is just rolling with what, right. <laughs> what you said uh, there. And I, I was just jotting some notes uh, here. Simplified disciple, when it comes to change, being mission focused and, and really um, pr- having a process that's well known uh, among uh, your congregation, that this is how we operate here. You know, that we're always we're always working on something. And uh, I just, I love that so much because Carl, I think that, you know, Jim would probably echo this, that I hear, I hear pastors tell me quite a bit, well, I can't, you know, I'm, I, I struggle with executing change within our congregation. There's always a lot of pushback. There's always, uh, and I, and I think you said, you said something that I think was so important that this, there's this surprise factor that, that people push it back against. I'm one of those people. I don't like surprises. I, I don't even want my family to throw me a surprise birthday party. I, <laughs> that's how much I don't like surprises. And, and so I wanted to just push up on that because I felt like, as you were saying, that those are the things that were really hitting me. And I, I assume that the people who are the leaders that are listening today or watching this podcast, uh, I would assume some of that is going to really register with them too. So I just wanted to uh, emphasize that as as well. Listen, uh, Carl, I have I have another question for you, and as we're we're already getting to close to time here, believe it or not, for uh, Pod 124. But what would you say to encourage pastors who are listening or watching today who lead a smaller church? Um, what what would be a positive next step or two? or maybe even three for them to take from your perspective? The, the first step, I've discovered this, I've been doing this for 10 years now. And so when I first wrote my book, I wrote it from my perspective and thought it was universal and turns out some of it isn't. But now I've traveled all over the country and all around the world the last 10 years. And so I've discovered a handful of principles that do appear to be uh, universal. And f- without question, the primary uh, obstacle to small churches becoming healthier is that the pastor and leadership doesn't know that a small church can be healthy while it's small. Hmm. Okay. If you don't know a small church can be healthy, you're going to pursue numbers first and think, well, when we get bigger, then we'll be able to. 
Right. And no, you can't, if you push, if you take an unhealthy small church and you just make it bigger, then you've got an unhealthy big church yeah. and that's not better. That's worse. <laughs> right. But if you take an unhealthy small church and you make it healthy, even if it doesn't get bigger, healthy is always better. Mm-hmm. But the first step is knowing you can become healthy at the current size you are right now. And if you don't know that, you won't even pursue it. That is so good. That is so good. And, so, and go ahead, Jim. Well, I, I know we're trying to, to wrap up, and I yep. we spent 25 minutes talking, Carl, and now I want to read everything you've ever written. So how, how is it we would <laughs> – how do I find your stuff? Or is there something you can put in the show notes that we could get your books and, and, and find out when you're coming to the town that I live in to do a seminar that I didn't know about? Like, how, how do we get in touch with what you're doing? Uh, everything I do is at carlvaders.com. So as long as you can figure out how to spell my name right, you'll get it all there. Spell it for us. Just... Yeah, Carl with a K, K-A-R-L, and Vaters with a T in the middle. So V-A-T-E-R-S, carlvaders.com. Okay. And if you go carlvaders.com slash schedule, that is where my speaking calendar <clears throat> is and where I will be and when. So And it's always regularly updated with all the new events and places I'll be speaking. Love it. Love it. John, any closing thoughts for this uh, episode 124 here? Well, Carl, I want to ask if you would uh, join us for another uh, pod because I I think we have more questions for you. Yeah, if it feels like we've just begun to scratch the surface here, absolutely. I'll be back. Yeah, right on. All right, very good. Well, we're going to we're going to go our separate ways here. And it's so um, such an honor to to be a part of the trust that goes between us as leaders uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Carl. And thank you to our listeners for allowing us to have this moment. And I, I think this is a good time for me to say, if this has been helpful to you, let's continue the conversation. Uh, convergecoach.com. Uh, if this has been helpful to you, like it, share it. Uh, one of the great things about free is, it, I, how many guys wish that like like cheeseburgers were calorie free? So you eat a lot of cheeseburgers. This, this, this has no downside to doing this a lot. So give it to everybody that you think might benefit from this and be looking next week for episode 125 as Carl's gonna join us again. In the meantime, God bless you, our dear watchers and listeners. We are praying for you, rooting for you, cheering for you, trying to find ways to encourage you as you continue to lead from a line.